yesterday, no, not yesterday, Wednesday, when we did some things in the lab about accessing websites. Uh, I think you may remember what we did. We accessed some websites and then we saw in the packet capture some DNS requests. Okay, so you see when we access the SIT website, there's a DNS request for www.sittu and so on. And in fact, what, what some web browsers do is that when you access this website, the web browser looks through the web page for all the links to other domains and automatically triggers requests for those. So sort of predicting that, oh, you may click on this link and instead of having to do the request then, it will, it's done the request already, so it already knows the IP address. So the web browsers may do many requests. And some students, I think in your section, you would have seen many DNS requests. And on the Monday, sorry, on the Wednesday morning section, someone saw many different requests to strange websites. And then they looked in the source code of the SIT web page. And if you look in the source, you'll see links to different websites. But they saw, saw a strange request. And I'll show you. I've got a screenshot of what we saw on inside the SIT web page. The, the source code for the SIT web page contains these links in there. This was in the SIT front web page. <laughs> wow. Right. And this was noticed in the lab because we saw the DNS request for these websites, which should not be in the SIT website. Someone had compromised the SIT website. Okay, so someone had, in somehow, I don't know, we only discovered on Wednesday, someone had inserted these links inside the SIT front web page. They've been removed. We let the computer centre know, and they've been removed since then. But the topic of this attack is to look at how attacks occur on websites and how someone may compromise a website and maybe insert information onto that web page that shouldn't be there and even do more dangerous things, delete data, uh, steal data uh, and do different attacks on websites. So that this topic is about uh, the different types of attacks that happen on websites. The intention is not for you to do the attacks. The intention is for you to create better websites such that the attacks are not possible. Okay, so we'll go through some examples. And tomorrow we'll do it in the lab. So we'll do some explanations today. Tomorrow in the lab you'll do some of the things that we cover and introduce today. So let's look at some aspects of different attacks on websites. To understand a lot of the attacks, we need to understand how web websites are developed, the implementation. So first, we'll just recap on what I mean by a web application. And again, I think you know this. You've created PHP-based websites. Some of the examples we'll use are using PHP, but they could be another language. Java, uh, ASP, other languages are used for the, for the websites, but for simplicity we'll use PHP as some examples, because I know you know that. So here's a, a model of a, a, a dynamic website. By dynamic I mean that the content that's served by the web server may change depending upon the request. So focusing on the, the communication between your web browser and web server, the web browser simply sends HTTP requests to the server. The server sends back responses. So that's what's communicated across the network. In a simple website, there's just a request, and if the page exists, it's sent back in the response. But a dynamic website, the web server will tailor the response according to the request. So I try and illustrate that here, that the web server may use some engine, some processing engine, like the PHP uh, interpreter, and maybe even a database that stores data or information. And what commonly happens is someone sends a request for a web page. The web server uses that engine, say the PHP interpreter, to 
execute some code, possibly read some data from the database, and then create on demand a web page that is then sent back. And the result is that the web page that's sent back may change over time, depending on who's making the request, what they've done in the past. So I know you've all implemented such websites already. You may have, have you implemented a login based system, anyone? Where someone types in their username and password in a form, it's submitted, and then the PHP code checks the, the username and password and either logs them in or not. So you may have done that. And other processing using PHP. So that's our web application. We want to see, well, how could you create that application so that it's hard for people to do attacks? That's the purpose of this topic. We know about HTTP already, the hypertext transfer protocol. In the simplest view, we send a request for a web page, we get a response back. HTTP on its own, we say, is stateless. What that means is that in between each request that it receives, it stores no state information about the past requests. So I send a request for index.html. I get the web page coming back. Welcome to this website. The same browser, sometime later, sends a request for the exact same web page. With HTTP, the web server doesn't care that this web browser has contacted the web server in the past. There's no state information stored about what happened in the past. To keep the web server simple, it just treats this. This is a new, independent request. Sends back welcome. That's what we mean by stateless. But that doesn't work very well for many applications we'd like to develop. We would like to have some personalization. That is, someone logs in and they get a, a web page back which is tailored to them. You view the website and it says your name on it. I view it and it says my name on it. So it's personalized to the user. Session management, meaning you visit the website now and then you visit it again tomorrow and it says welcome back, you were here just yesterday. And it keeps track of what you've done in the past presents uh, something based upon uh, your history of actions on that website and that's also related to tracking, keeping track of what the user has done on the website. So we'd like such features. HTTP doesn't provide that so we use, there are some extra mechanisms that provide such features. Personalization of responses, here's an example, very simple one. Browser X sends a request to the web for index.php, the server sends back the, the, the web page, which says welcome to this website. And the server then stores some state information. It stores something at the server saying browser X visited at 11 a.m. on the 12th of February. That's what we mean by state information. Then when browser X visits the same page again, the server uses that state information to tailor the response it sends back. And instead of saying welcome, it says welcome back to my web page because it knows that you visited previously. So the server in this case keeps some state information. It knows that this is the second visit by browser X. Three minutes later, for example. And the server keeps that state information and if another browser, browser Y, visits the same web page, then the server doesn't say welcome back because they know this is the first visit of Y. Okay, so this is just an example of state information for per personalization. How do you implement this in, say, PHP or, or other technologies? What, how do you implement this, this feature? I think you may have done it. If you've developed a PHP website where someone logs in, you would have used the techniques to implement this. Think of a food. Anyone?
we'll see on the next few slides. Cookies. Okay. Cookies are one feature that allows us to keep this state information. We'd like the server to be able to identify who is accessing the website. Is it X or Y? And have they been here before? Cookies provides a, a functionality such that we can keep track of what people have done, some state information. The other thing we'd like to do, and again, I think you're aware, or we've done it already, is to manage login sessions. So allow someone to log in, do something that only they can do, only they are authorised to do, and maybe keep some state based upon them. For example, I log in to see my results for some course. So I visit some login page. So I, I send a request to the server to get the login.php page, which really presents a, a HTML form to me, a form with some boxes where I can enter in my username and password. So that's sent back in the response. When I type in the values for username and password and press submit on my browser, that triggers my browser to send a HTTP message to the server. But it's a slightly different type of message. This is what we call a post message. It can be done with a get message, but an, uh, maybe a better way is to use a post message where instead of get this URL, post this data to this URL. So it may be encoded as a post and inside the URL includes my username and password. That message is sent to the server. The server checks the supplied username and password with what's already stored in the server, so they must have registered in the past. They authenticate the server, and if it is successful, sends back a message, welcome Steve. So now it knows my name since I've logged in. And then when I click on a link to the results page, the server knows, or you know, the server knows that it's me that's visiting the results page and it will send back results which are tailored to me. That's what we'd like to be able to achieve. So the web server knows this is X contacting us again. X has already been authenticated. There should be no need to re-authenticate and we send back a tailored response. If someone else, browser Y, tries to get the results, they may get a message back saying, you are not logged in. You cannot view the results until you log in. So that's another type of feature that we'd like to implement. And again, cookies can be used to do this. State information at the server. So what we said is that on its own, HTTP is stateless. But to implement these features that we'd like, we need some state information at the server, and cookies provide that for us. A way to implement state with HTTP. A cookie is a data structure. So it's just a, a, a set of information, and the normal things that it includes, it's quite simple. It includes a name, a value, some t date and time when that cookie expires, the path refers to the, uh, the URL that it's valid for, so a directory, for example. The domain refers to the, the domain of the website where that cookie is valid for, like www.sittuact.h. And if we're using HTTPS, or no, uh, a flag to indicate whether we should be using HTTPS to, with this cookie or not whether our communication should be encrypted or not. And we'll see that as we go through some attacks, what that means. How it may be used is that the web server creates the cookie. So when someone first accessed the website, the web server creates a cookie and sends it back in the response. So the HTTP response that comes from server to client contains part of that cookie, that it, the information in the cookie. And the server stores that information related to the cookie. That's the session or state information we call. 
So what the result will be is the server knows that information. They know that uh, browser from this IP address at this time accessed our web server and there, here's some session information about that user and sends the cookie back to the browser. Step two, the browser, when it receives a cookie, it stores it in its local storage on your computer. And the next time your browser sends a request to the same domain, it will include the cookie in that request. And the cookie is received by the server in that HTTP request and it tells the server that this is the same browser that accessed before because the cookie can contain some unique values which identify that browser. So the first time you access the website, the cookie is created and the server stores some session information and sends the cookie back to you, the browser. Every subsequent request from your browser to the same website will include that cookie. And whenever the server receives the cookie, it knows, ah, this is the person who accessed at the start, because it identifies them. The cookie will contain values which uniquely identify who is communicating. It will not be the same for each, each user that's accessing the, accessing the website. We'll, we'll see some examples of cookies soon. Here's this concept. So first I visit the website and I visit the login page. And the server sends back a, a HTML form asking me for my username and password. And I type, it in, type them in and press submit or post the, the values. So this third message going to the server contains my username and password. It's received by the server. The server checks those values. Are they valid? Yes, let's assume they're OK, so the user is authenticated. Then the server stores information about that user. For example, they store the username, Steve, and they maybe store some unique value that identifies this user. And here I've listed in this example an ID hash, some hash of an ID. We'll see the, an implementation of that shortly, but some unique value for that user. So they store that, let's say, in a database or in a file at the server. In addition, the HTTP response that comes back saying, welcome, Steve, also in the header fields includes those values of the cookie. Or specifically, the set cookie field says, username is Steve, ID hash is this, say, random value. When your browser receives that, those values, it stores them locally. The next time your browser visits the same website, it sends a request for the results page, it includes those values in the request. Steve and the ID hash. And quite simply, the server compares the received values with those stored by the server. If they match, the server has now identified you. This is Steve accessing the website. It's not someone else. And that allows them to send back a tailored response. Questions about cookies so far? We need to know this as background so that we can understand some of the attacks that take place on websites. Any questions from the back? You like cookies? OK. We will see shortly some examples. And you'll see a little bit more tomorrow in the lab. Any questions? OK, good. <laughs> Everyone likes them. There are some issues with cookies. We may not discuss them so much now. Uh, all right, we'll mention them, but we'll come back to the advantages and disadvantages later. When you first visit the website and the server sends back 
those set cookie values, your browser stores them, stores those values. There can be a, a lifetime associated with a cookie. So the question is, how long should you store them? And there are two basic approaches. Session cookies, there's no expiry time, but those cookies are deleted when you close the browser. Okay, so a session cookie is just while you're browsing for this session, for this period of time. And the other approach is persistent cookies. There's some expiry date set. And when you close the browser, those cookies are saved. So that when you start the browser tomorrow, then uh, they are still there. Uh, they will be deleted when the expiry date is, is set, is, is met. So the expiry date may be set differently. And in fact, the user should be able to, and, and can in different browsers, delete or manually manage the cookies that they, they have access to. So one question then is, should, when should session-based cookies and when should persistent cookies be used? And we'll see some examples as we go through. The other aspect is that when you receive a cookie, the cookie contains a field called domain, which indicates what website or what domain of the web server should it be valid for. A first part party cookie is one where the, the website that you're accessing, the URL, the domain of that is the same as that stored for the cookie. So let's say we have a cookie for uh, google.com. You visit google.com, you get the cookie. The domain inside the cookie is google.com. When you visit google.com again, then we'd say that the URL you're visiting, the domain of that matches that of the cookie. So that's a first party cookie. But if the cookie has the domain google.com and then you visit another URL, facebook.com, if you send your cookie value from your browser to facebook.com, then we'd refer to that as a third party cookie. We're sending the cookie which is relevant for one domain to a different domain. And generally we don't want to do that, or the user may not want to do that. The website may want you to send the cookie, but generally that's used for other, for websites to track the users to track which websites they've visited and what they've been doing on, on, on the internet. So some browsers will have settings such that they will not allow third party cookies. They'll only allow you to send a cookie to the domain, uh, to a URL which, where the domain matches that of the cookie. And we'll see that a little bit when we, we come up with, I'll show you an example of a cookie shortly and see the, the values. Uh, cookies, when we're using HTTP, cookies are sent in the request and response, yes. All right, first and third party cookie. I'll explain them again now, but then we'll show an example shortly. So the cookie contains in, when we first get the cookie, Okay, we can think the cookie contains a domain where we got it from. If I get a cookie from google.com, then the domain of that cookie is google.com. And my browser stores that. So my browser stores the value, the domain field will be google.com. If I visit Google, a, a website with the domain google.com, then I send that cookie to google.com, then we'd refer to that cookie as a first party cookie. The domain of that cookie matches the domain of the website I'm accessing. That's normal. Okay, that's how we normally use cookies. But if the domain of the cookie is google.com and I, my web browser, sends that cookie to say facebook.com, the domain of the cookie is google.com. The domain of the web server is facebook.com. That's what we call a third party cookie. And 
from the web browser's perspective, normally we would not like to do that. Because what that does is it potentially allows that web server to know what you've been doing on other websites. And we'll see that, of course, the exchange of cookies is always automated. The, the human user has very little role in it. So it's up to the preferences of the browser as to how to handle them. Let's get to an example of a cookie. We'll say something about HTTPS later. So the example, and we're going to do this tomorrow in, in, uh, in the lab. What we'll do is we'll set up a virtual network and we'll act, and it's already got some fake websites deployed or some demo websites and we'll use the web browser to access them and do some attacks. I've already set that up and I'll just show you what we have and, and first illustrate the cookies and how they're used. not so easy to see, but the network we have has five, five nodes, has a router in the middle. I think today we'll deal with just, there's a normal web browser, there's a web server, and in the attacks we'll see that there's another web browser, what we'll call the malicious web browser, some malicious user trying to uh, do something bad, and we'll also see a fake or a malicious web server. So nodes one, two, three, four, and five. That yet. So let me set it up. Node 3, I think we don't need to look at just yet. This is the node 4, is the, the website that we have, and I'll show you what it does in a moment. But node 1 is the browser. So node 1 is our normal users running the web browser. I think for now we'll just use Lynx as a text-based browser, but later we'll use Firefox. Uh, let's just demonstrate the website. There's a website on node 4, which is... Lynx has some benefits in this case because we'll see that we can easily modify cookies. It, it's quite easy to modify when we do an attack. And it's, it's very lightweight in here. But it's not so complex a website that we need graphics. So the domain is of the normal website is myuni.edu. And the idea of this website is it allows students to log in and see their grades. And it allows uh, faculty members to log in and modify the grades of students. And the, the policy of this website is that We'll see there are two demo students, but the students can only see their own grades. Okay, you should not be able to see other students' grades. Students cannot change their grades. Okay, that's, that's expected. If you could change your grades, then it wouldn't be so good for us. Uh, and the faculty member can change grades and can see the grades of all students. So that's the general requirements. Uh, for this demo website. And I've gone to the wrong page. I'll quit that. There's actually a path here, grades. There's a subsite. So myuni.edu and the grades system. And here's the front page. It's, it's not very complicated. The links down the bottom are just some help or explanation about the website. But from the welcome page, it asks you to log in. You can't do much unless you log in. So I log in and I need, let's say as a student, I need a username and password and I've got some and a password 
and I click on the login link. And note with links, it says, so links is quite strict here, it says I've received a cookie. So what happened when I pressed the login link is it triggered a request to go to the server and the server sent back a reply and the reply included that set cookie value. Username was this, the student username, and Links has asked me, do you want me to allow us to, to use this cookie? And I would say, uh, A for always, let's always accept it for that domain. And it actually does some redirection, and now I'm logged in. So you see, welcome to this student. Let's view the grades. So there's some links here. The main thing we can do is either view the grades or log out. View the grades. And the, the grade viewing system is very simple. Either you, you should only be able to view your grades. So it's pre-populated with my ID at this stage. If I want to view the grades of a particular course, I'll enter the course code. If I want to see all my grades, I'll leave the course code empty. For example, and now click on submit. This is a form, so we'll use this uh, to demonstrate an attack later, but this is uh, a form that will post information to the server. It will post the ID and the course code to the server, and what the server should do is look up that in the database and return the correct grade. And I know you know how to implement that. So it gets the grades, fine. And if I view grades again, if I delete that, then I can see all my grades. In this case, just for two courses. So that's the basics of the system. Let's go look at the cookie. Note that I'm logged in. Uh, let's see another feature. Let's view the grades. Let's try and view someone else's grades. There's another user. That's their ID, I know that. I want to view their grades. And the website returns an error or an, a message saying you can only view your own grades. Okay, so this is this session management. Somehow the web server's implemented, or the code that's PHP is implemented such that it checks that the right user is logged in and only they can see their grades. You can't see other people's grades. That's the wrong page. I'm going to quit and try it again. What I'm going to do this time is do the same thing and log in. The way that links works is when I close the browser, it deletes all cookies. So if I log access again, then I will uh, have to log in again. Normally your browser may store the cookies, but links automatically deletes the cookies by default. So we'd need to log in. So I've got just some modifications so that we can save the cookies. A different config. The details of this config are not so important. Let me get this right. Because we want to look at a cookie. I'll log in again. Can anyone see my password? How would you see my password? How would you obtain it? No, here I am accessing my browser on node 1. The web server's on node 4. What would you need to find my password? If you were, maybe you had access to the router on node 3. Maybe you ran the network. You could capture on the router and you could intercept the packets being sent. 
because it's using HTTP, nothing's encrypted. So when I type in my username and password here and press submit, it sends those values in a HTTP get rec or a HTTP post message to the server, unencrypted with HTTP. So anyone between the browser and the server, in theory, can ob observe that username and password. So that's one of the web attacks. Intercept other people's traffic. Learn the data. It redirects to some page after I log in and I can view the grades. Let's view the cookie. Here I can see my cookie jar. It shows from my browser's perspective what cookies I have. And here it is. Here's one, the, I've only got one cookie in this case. We can see the domain is for www.myuni.edu. The value, we have a, a value, or the name, username, and the value is the, the, the student ID in this case. The path refers to the path in the URL, so slash. So anything under slash, this is valid for. Some other information about uh, the the web server that it's using port 80, there's no HTTPS, so it's not secure. This is something about the expiry time. The maximum, ti maximum gobble date is the time when we uh, should eat the cookie. So there's some date associated with it. And another one, so there are in fact two, cookie, two values here. ID hash is the other name, and here's its value. It's actually some hash value and similar values, as similar other parameters. So these are the, the two cookies, in fact, I have two cookies in this case. One is the username, one is the ID hash. This is stored in my browser. Every time I send a request to www.myuni.edu, my browser sends these values. Sends the username and the ID hash. And that's how the web server knows it's me that's accessing. So the web server doesn't prompt me to log in again. It, uh, it will use the cookies to know it's me logged in. So how can I perform an attack from a malicious user's perspective do you, how could I log in as someone else? How could I see another student's grades, for example? Related to the cookie. Here I am on node one. My browser has these cookie values. When I send a request to the server, the server matches these values with me and shows me my information. What type of attack could be used on this? What could a malicious user ta do to take advantage of this information? What the mal a malicious user on another browser could do, if they know these values, so on node 2, for example, they could open their browser and if they know these values, we'll talk about how they'd know them, but if they did know these values, then they could set the values of cookies on their browser to be exactly the same as these, the ID, hash, and the username. And when their browser accesses the web server, their browser sends these values to the web server. The web server checks the received values against the session information and sees that it matches for user 5 with 9 O's effectively allowing that user to log in as this user. So this is what's calling uh, an attack that involves stealing someone's cookies. If you can obtain the cookie values of someone else's browser, then potentially you can log in from their usernames uh, as their user, even without knowing their password. You don't need to know their password.
let me open node 2 and try that attack. This is node 2, another web browser. This other user can log in. They're a different user. They have a different user ID, a password, and they can log in. And the web server sends a co tailored response back identifying that user, and that user can see their grades only. Now, I will quit. So this orange user is this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the, other, the original user is the all zeros user. What we want to do as the attacker, this user, is to view the grades of the all zeros user. So what I'll do is I'll exit my browser. And the way that the links browser works is it saves the cookies in a file called links cookies. So these are the cookie values for this user. Let's change them. And we need the hash value. What I'm going to do is steal the hash value from the other user. If the malicious user can learn this value, So I'll copy it from the other cookie jar. So now my malicious user has the cookie values of the original user. And we'll exit that. Access the website again. Who am I logged in as? The all zeros user. What happened is that my browser sent those cookie values to the server. The server identifies me as that all zeros user because those cookie values correspond to our original user. This was the, the normal user. If we can learn these values, we can log in as that user. The question you're all about to ask is how do I learn these values? That is, this is someone on their computer. You're on another computer. How do you learn their cookie values on their web browser? If you can capture, capture the, the, the packets sent between their browser and the server, the cookie values are included in those messages. So you just need to capture them. Or if you can get physical access to their computer, you could uh, covertly copy the cookie files across to your computer, okay, if you have that physical access. So there may be ways that you can learn the cookie values of someone else's computer, and once you do that, you can effectively log in as them. So that's one attack on websites. Before we go on in general about web security, any, any questions about cookies?
we will not try now, but maybe tomorrow in the lab we can try and capture the actual packets. And you'll see, if you do capture the packets between node 1 and the web server, say on the router, you'll see in some of those packets contain the cookie values. If you can do that, you can steal the cookie. The other thing you could do it if, in practice, someone's using their browser and using Wi-Fi without encryption, then again, it's very easy to intercept and capture someone's packets wirelessly and therefore steal their cookies. How do you prevent that? How do you prevent someone from stealing your cookies? Encrypt. That is, use HTTPS. So if you encrypt that HTTP GET request to the POST request and the responses, the cookie values are also encrypted. So to prevent a cookie stealing attack, encryption is important. HTTPS is the main technique. Let's log out of this user. Log out here. And log out. Wrong way. So in links, the reason I use links here is because it's very easy to edit the cookies. So we'll get rid of the cookies file. We logged out. Logging out in this case is simply deleting the cookies. So the concept of log out, if you delete the cookies, then when you try to access that website again, there's nothing to send to the server and it cannot identify you. So there is no cookies left. So we'll see one of the attacks mentions cookie stealing and other aspects of stealing information. What we're going to do is there are many different types of attacks on websites and it's, it's quite, quite difficult to develop a complex website that is secure. So there are many different recommendations of how to develop a, a good website that is secure. We will go through just a selection of different attacks and some of the, the mechanisms or give suggestions on mechanisms to, to prevent the attacks. And I've taken these attacks from some organization called o OWASP. What is OWASP? It's actually the name of a project and or organization, the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a group of, organi or a group of companies and people that have got together and they do many things. One of them is to try to give recommendations of how to develop secure websites, secure web applications. And one way they do that is they look at many of the risks, many of the attacks, and try and prioritize the efforts against uh, defending against those attacks. So there's a definition or a statement about what OWASP tries to do. Uh, the website gives a lot of information. They provide everything for free, so all the information is there. They provide tutorials on how to develop, uh, say, login systems, how to store passwords, how to do things regarding web application security. They provide some code and some APIs if you need to develop a, your own website security mechanism. And of interest to our lecture is that they, what they do every few years, every three or four years, they do a survey of different companies and they try and learn about the, the main attacks that take place on web applications. And they come up with a top ten. And what we're going to go, do is go through that top ten web attacks and explain them with the intent that you'll be aware and be able to defend against them. So they develop a, a top 10 really web application security risks. And they've been released uh, over different years. So the last one I've looked at is 2013. Maybe they've got a new one coming this or next year. And they collect data from different companies about who has a t who has what real attacks have been performed. So they get a collection of 
half a million different risks or vulnerabilities across many different companies and try to rank which one's the most severe. And they come up with a top 10. And this is it. This is their top 10. That is what they think are the most, uh, most important web security risks to address in developing of applications. And we'll go through each of them, some in more detail than others. Injection, uh, we'll, we'll explain later. Some of them we'll explain now, briefly. Broken authentication and session management, simply that is the login system doesn't work or the tracking of users doesn't work correctly. Maybe some student who got a low grade in Dr. Dun Dr. Tanarak's database course develops a website and they make some mistakes in the login system. That allows an attacker to log in when they shouldn't be able to, for example. That's an example of broken authentication and session management. Cross-site scripting, we'll explain that one. And secure direct object references, what else can we say? Security misconfiguration is that maybe you install some software on your server, you're setting up a website, and you don't set it up correctly. Maybe you forget to set some parameter value and that makes your website insecure. Okay, you forget to enable the protection on some uh, directory or some files, which means someone can do, do an attack. Sensitive data exposure means that the data that should be confidential is made available to people who shouldn't be able to see it. It's exposed. For example, the cookies are exposed. That's an example there. The cookies, which are sensitive data, they're data that's only the, the web browser should be able to see and the server. If they are exposed to people, then someone can do an attack. And the rest, so we'll go through them some with some detailed examples and some just, just briefly. Most of the risks are due to uh, poor development practices. The person implementing the website does something wrong or doesn't follow the standard or the recommended approach. Maybe they're not aware of it or they take a shortcut and that leads to the risk and poor configuration practices. So that when they're setting something up, configuring the software, they, they are not careful and that leads to a risk. So to, to uh, reduce the, the, the impact of those risks, you should try and follow secure programming practices when you develop websites. We're not going to talk about that in this course, how to, do, how to program websites web applications, but I recommend if you, and many of you will, get a job that involves creating a website for some organisation, then find some of these recommendations and OWASP is a good starting point. They have many examples and tutorials on how to develop different security mechanisms. Some, some risks are due to the software you're using having bugs or vulnerabilities. That is, uh, rather than developing the website from scratch, you download some code and use that, someone else's code. But that code has a bug which makes it open for some attack on, on your website. So how to stop that, be aware of what software you're using and make sure it's up to date and, and it's, it doesn't have, or, or you're aware of the bugs that are uh, announced. So let's look at, for today, with only 15 minutes left, the, a selection of the top 10 risks. And I may just skip over some to find the easier ones to do this afternoon. Uh, maybe injection, although injection is the number one in the list. It needs a little bit more time to explain and it's a good thing to go through tomorrow to see how the injection attack works. SQL injection you may have heard of, but in general injection attacks involve, so we'll do one tomorrow, but it involves really 
uh, the attacks we'll see submitting data to the server and getting the server to process that when it shouldn't process and do something that it shouldn't do. So we'll see that uh, in terms of queries on websites or databases. But let's find an easier one to go through. Broken authentication and session management. Someone develops a website and it allows people to log in and once someone's logged in it keeps track that they're logged in but they don't do it very well and it allows an attack to take place. So some examples of what can go wrong here. We normally, to keep track of users, we uh, can talk about a user when they log in or in a session. They start a session and for when they're accessing that website, it's all that maintained within that one session. So we give the user some session ID. Okay. Often, or well that session ID should be uh, included in cookies. We saw the session ID was really the ID hash. The ID hash was a hash of some session ID. And that uniquely identified that user to the web server. But if you include that session ID, say, in the URL of the pages that you're for your website, like this one, I've shortened it, so there's some website, and when you log in to the website, you're given a session ID, like this random value here, and when you visit, click on links on that website, the session ID is included in the URL as a parameter. When the web server receives the request for this, it checks the session ID and checks that it mat matches the one for the logged in user in the same way that the ID hash was used in the cookie. The problem with this approach is it's very easy for someone to steal this session ID. They don't even have to capture the packets. They just need to see the URL. Because what can happen if someone sees that, okay, Steve is using this session ID, if they can learn this value, then they can visit this URL and their browser will be identified as me to the web server. And how that may happen, let's say I, uh, I've logged in, this is my session ID, and I want to send a link to my friend about, oh, you can access the grades from this website. So I send an email with this link. I don't realize that that link includes a session ID. So I send the link to my friend, my friend clicks on that link, and they are logged in with my session ID. So they immediately logged in as me. So storing the session ID in the URL is bad. It should be stored in the cookie. And even better, the cookie should be encrypted using HTTPS. Similar you develop a website and you're debugging, debugging it. You're trying to fix some errors and you turn on the debugging features such that the website prints out all the, the, the messages. If it prints out when you have error messages the session ID, some attacker could learn the session ID and, and, and use that for an attack. So session IDs are one way to manage sessions. They should be kept confidential for the user. They shouldn't be made available to other people. Another simple example of something going wrong. You log in, you get some session ID, it's in a cookie, and then you leave the computer. Okay, maybe it's a public computer in the lab. You're still logged in. Okay, the the cookie doesn't expire for another day. It's, you're effectively still logged in. So if someone goes to that browser, the browser wasn't closed, or the cookie wasn't deleted, then they are logged in as you. So there's a problem. And it's due to the fact that in this case, timeouts are too long. That is, the, the server should automatically log you out after some period of time. It shouldn't be too short such that you get logged out all the time but it shouldn't be too long such that someone else could steal your session. 
What else? Uh, the storage of passwords. We've studied that at the start of the course, how to store passwords. We take the password, we concatenate with a salt value, and we hash those values. We store the hash value in the database. If you implement a website and you just store the password in the database, if someone gets access to your password database now that they know the passwords of all your users, and that's bad. So the prevention there, use appropriate password storage mechanisms and also get the users to select a passwords in an appropriate manner. We've studied that already. So that's about all to say about this. It's number two on the set of risks, so it's uh, a problem. Uh, but they're quite easy solutions, really. Use cookies, encrypt them, preferably, HTTPS, and use passwords in the right way, which we've studied already. But there are other uh, examples as well. Any questions on session management? Let's see if we can find just one or two more to finish for today, just simple ones. This one's a complex one to go through. Uh, this one's easy. You create a website. Similar to before, the, the website uses, let's say, an ID in the URL to identify a user. So. The website shows the grades for the user, which user's grades to show. You implement your website so that the ID is given in the URL. All right? 54123 is the ID of the user. Well, in such a simple case, if you do that, then someone can simply try a different ID and submit that to the web server and see if that returns the grades of someone else. Okay, so it's easy for an attacker to just change the URL. So if you in include important information in the URL, then the attacker can potentially modify that and, in this case, try to pretend to be someone else and, and get the grades of someone else. So here we're using the ID parameter in the URL, URL to identify some object. And some attack could involve modifying that reference value to access some other object. It's referred to an insecure direct object reference. Another example, sometimes you may create a website that allows you to download files from the server. And maybe the interface is that you've got a, a program called fi file.php. Actually, it doesn't just download files, it shows the contents of files. It shows the file. So you write file.php, and that PHP code takes a parameter called the name of the file. So the idea is that when someone visits this URL, it will display the file lecture.pdf. But what the attacker does is that they modify that URL and they specify a different file, one that you didn't think or didn't want them to access. For example, they set the, the name to be the slash etc password file and your code, the PHP code, simply reads that file and displays it on the screen. And now the attacker has learnt that password database on your operating system of your server. So just simple examples of attacks. There are easy ways to prevent these, but just to explain the, the, the concept. How do you stop such attacks? Some examples you need to perform some access control. So every time someone requests an object, check that that logged in user has permissions to access that object. 
So don't just do it by ID in this case. So in this case, all right, someone's logged in as ID 54123. Then an attacker logs in. Or we try, sorry, we're logged in as 54123, but we change this ID parameter to something else. Then the website, the web application should check. Is this logged in user, 54123, the same as the requested ID? If not, don't allow them to, to view that. Similar to what I did with my login system, the users cannot view the grades of other users. So the implementation of that is to do a check. If the ID doesn't match the logged in user ID, then you cannot access. An example of, let's say, the, the link to files, or the way to download or view files, let's say you give each file a unique ID, and that's stored in your database. So if you want to view the lecture.pdf file, the link says the ID is this, maybe some hash of the file. Now, if an attacker wants to view the slash etc slash password file, they need to guess what the ID of that file is. And that's hard if this value is long enough. Okay, so if you make it long enough, it's hard for the attacker, practically impossible for the attacker to guess the right value for a particular file. So there are different ways to uh, make it difficult for the attacker to just modify the URL to get something that not, that they're not allowed to get. Let me just see if there's some easy ones to go through. Yes, there is. This one's easy. You set up a website. You're not going to program the entire website yourself. You're going to install some software to do some parts for you. For example, you install PHP MyAdmin or WordPress or some web uh, or content management system. You download it and install it. Usually they inclu include some admin console so that the administrator can log in and set the thing up from the web, web page. And usually they come with default passwords. So a simple example of security misconfiguration is you leave the default password there. So someone else who accesses your website simply guesses the password for the admin page of your software and now has admin access to your website. Okay, so a simple case of you misconfigure your web application. Uh, another one, some web servers will allow you to view the set of files in a particular directory. Let's see if we can find an example. For example, when I visit this URL, the software page on SIT, what the web server does is it lists the files in the directory. It's not a real web page. I haven't written HTML. The web server just automatically looks at all the files in the directory and shows me a list, a nice list. That's intended in this case. Okay? That's how I want it to be. But in some cases, if you create a website and you don't want people to see the files in the directory, but you don't set up the web server so that it does show this, then what can happen is if someone guesses the directory, they can do this, and they see all the files there. Some of them you may wa not want them to see and to know that they are there. Then they can select the files and, and download them. So. make sure that web server is configured such that usually by default that it doesn't show files which are in directories unless they're explicitly uh, in a link.
Another simple example that people may uh, do wrong is that they're developing their application and when they're debugging they turn on a feature that it prints out all the messages, all the error messages on the web page. Or at the bottom of the web page it prints the error messages. Well, that can give information to the attacker that allows them to learn something about your website which may give them a chance to do other attacks. So you want to hide that information. Debugging output error messages should not be displayed on web pages. How do you stop security misconfiguration? You need to make sure you go through some well-defined procedures when you deploy software and you test software. Don't just install it and hope that it works. Uh, upgrade your software uh, as upgrades become available. Keep components separate so a compromise of one doesn't compromise others. Uh, where possible, keep, keep either parts of the website or different servers separate such that if you install one piece of software on one server, if that's compromised, it won't allow an attacker to compromise your other server. So there's just some general recommendations. Uh, for example, that you, you install uh, WordPress on one site and on that same server you install some other um, Drupal or Moodle on there as well. There's a bug in WordPress that allows the attacker to access and do bad things there. You can set up your server such that it minimizes the chance that even though they can do attacks on the WordPress website, they cannot attack the other, the Moodle website. So try to keep them separate. Uh, and that involves setting up the server and setting up the applications. In, uh, there's different ways to, to, to keep them separate. Not necessarily a separate server, but setting up, setting up the operating system so that they, the users that can access those files, the permissions on those files are appropriate, so that the user that accesses the, the, the WordPress website is different than the user that accesses the Moodle website. So if someone can get and log in as that user for WordPress, they still can't do anything on the Moodle website. separation of functionality can be useful. But it requires effort to, to set that up. What we'll do tomorrow, and we'll do it in the lab, so we'll see you in the net la network lab at 9 a.m. We'll go through some of these other attacks, and we'll do it in the virtual network. Uh, we'll get through, I think, three or four in the time we have. So we'll explain them briefly and then demonstrate them to see uh, them working.